hour or so after we've done our business here. Their fear lies about a quarter of an inch below the surface, just like everybody else in this spoiled, rotten country. They are afraid of their own shadows, but especially pain or even a little discomfort. Can't you see that on their faces, Slava? They're afraid of us. They just don't know it yet. Slava looked around the main plaza, which was dominated by Nordstrom and Neiman Marcus. There were signs up everywhere for Teen People magazine's Rock and Shop Tour. Meanwhile, their target had just bought a fifty-dollar box of cookies at Neiman's. Amazing. Then she bought something equally absurd, called a red, white, and blue dog journal, which was prohibitively expensive as well. Stupid, stupid people, keeping notebooks for a dog. Slava thought. Then he spotted the target again. She was coming out of Skechers with her small children in tow. Actually, the target looked a little apprehensive to them at the moment. Why was that? Maybe she was afraid that she would be recognized and have to sign an autograph, or make small talk with her fans. Price of fame, eh? She moved quickly now, guiding the precious little ones into Dick Clark's American Bandstand Grill, presumably for lunch, but maybe just to escape the crowds. Dick Clark came from Philadelphia, near here. Slava said, "Did you know that? Who the hell cares about Dick Clark, Dick Tracy, or Dick Less?" said Zoya, and hammered Slava's bicep with her fist. "Stop these stupid trivia games. It gives me a headache. Excedrin headache number one trillion since I met you." The target certainly fit the description they had been given by their controller: tall, blonde, ice queen, full of herself, but also tasty down to the last detail. Thought Slava, it made sense. He supposed she had been purchased by a client who called himself the art director. The couple waited about fifty minutes. A middle school choir from Broomall, Pennsylvania, was performing in the atrium. Then the target and her two kids emerged from the restaurant. Let's do it," said Slava. "This should be interesting, no? The kids make it the challenge." "No," Zoya said. The kids make it insane. Wait until the wolf hears about this; he'll have puppies. That's American slang, by the way. Chapter twenty-four. The name of the woman who'd been purchased was Audrey Meek. She was a celebrity, having founded a highly successful line of women's fashions and accessories called Meek. It was her mother's maiden name and the one she used herself. The couple watched her closely, tailed her into the parking garage without creating suspicion. They jumped her as she was putting her Neiman Marcus and Hermes and other shopping bags into a shiny black Lexus SUV with New Jersey plates. Children, run, run away! Audrey Meek struggled fiercely as Zoya tried to stuff an acrid-smelling gauzy cloth over her nose and mouth. Soon she saw circles, stars, and bright colors for a few dramatic seconds. Then she finally passed out in Slava's powerful arms. Zoya peered around the parking garage. It was nothing much to look at: cement walls with numbers and letter marks. Nobody anywhere near them. Nobody noticing anything wrong, even though the children were yelling and starting to cry. Leave my mommy alone! Andrew Meek shouted and threw punches at Slava, who only smiled at the boy. "Good little fellow," he applauded. "Protect your mama. She would be proud of you. I am proud of you." "Let's go, stupid!" shouted Zoya. As always, she was the one who took care of all the important business. It had been that way since she was growing up in Moskovskaya Oblast outside Moscow, and had decided she couldn't bear to be either a factory worker or a prostitute. What about the kids? We can't leave them here," said Slava. "Leave them. That's what we're supposed to do, you idiot. We want witnesses. That's the plan. Can't you keep anything straight? In the garage? Leave them here? They'll be fine. Or not? Who the hell cares? Gun. We must go now." They drove off in the Lexus with the target Audrey Meek unconscious on the back seat and her two children wailing in the parking garage. Zoya drove at a moderate speed around the mall, then turned onto the DeKalb Pike. They traveled only a few minutes to the Valley Forge National Historical Park, 
where they switched cars. Then, another eight miles to a remote parking area where they changed vehicles yet again. Then, off to Ottsville in the Bucks County area of Pennsylvania. Soon, Mrs. Meek would meet the art director, who was madly in love with her. He must have been. He had paid $250,000 for the pleasure of her company, whatever that might be. And there had been witnesses to the abduction, a screw-up on purpose. Part 2. Fidelity, Bravery, Integrity. Chapter 25. No one had been able to figure out the wolf yet. According to information from Interpol and the Russian police, he was a no-nonsense, hands-on operator who had originally been trained as a policeman. Like many Russians, he was able to think in very fluid, common-sense terms. That native ability was sometimes given as the reason the Mir space station was able to stay in space so long. The Russian cosmonauts were simply better than the Americans at figuring out everyday problems. If something unexpected went wrong in the spacecraft, they fixed it. And so did the wolf. On that sunny afternoon, he drove a black Cadillac to the northern section of Miami. He needed to see a man named Yegi Titov about some security matters. Yegi liked to think of himself as a world-class website designer and cutting-edge engineer. He had a doctorate from Cal Berkeley and never let anyone forget it. But Yegi was just another pervert and creep with delusions of grandeur and an attitude, a really bad attitude. The wolf banged on the metal door of Yegi's apartment in a high-rise overlooking Biscayne Bay. He was wearing a skull cap and a Miami Heat windbreaker just in case anyone saw him visiting. All right, all right, hold your urine, Yegi shouted from inside. It took him another couple of minutes to finally open up. He had on blue jean shorts and a tattered, faded black novelty store sweatshirt with Einstein's grinning face on it. Quite the kidder, that Yegi. I told you not to make me come and see you, the wolf said. But he was smiling broadly, as if he were making a big joke. So Yegi smiled, too. They had been business associates for about a year, which was a long time for anyone to put up with the Yegi. Your timing is perfect, he said. How lucky for me, said the wolf as he strolled into the living room and immediately wanted to hold his nose. The apartment was an incredible dump, littered with fast food wrappers and pizza boxes, empty milk cartons, and dozens, maybe a hundred old copies of Novaya Ruskaya Slovo, the largest Russian-language newspaper in the United States. The odor of filth and decaying food was bad enough, but even worse was Yegi himself, who always smelled like weak old sausages. The science man led him into a bedroom off the living room area, only it turned out not to be a bedroom at all. It was the lab of a very disorganized person. Ugly brown carpeting, three beige CPU boxes on the floor, and parts in a corner— Discarded heat sinks, circuit boards, hard drives. You are a pig, the wolf said, then laughed again. But a very smart pig. In the center of the room was a modular desk. Three flat-screen displays formed a semicircle around a well-worn rumble chair. Behind the display screens was a fire hazard of intertwined cables. There was only one outside window the blind permanently drawn. Your sight is very secure now, Yegi said. Primo, 100%, no possible screw-ups, the way you like it. I thought it was already secure, the wolf replied. Well, now it's more secure. You can't be too careful these days. Tell you what else, I finished the latest brochure. <laughs> it's a classic, instant classic. Yes, and only three weeks late. Yegi shrugged his bony shoulders. So what? Wait till you see my work. It's genius. Can you recognize genius when you see it? This is genius. The wolf examined the pages before he said anything to the science man. The brochure was printed on eight and a half by eleven inch glossy paper bound in a clear report cover with a red spine. Yegi had cranked it out on his HP color laser printer. The colors were electric. 
The cover looked perfect. The elegance was weird, actually, as if the wolf were looking at a Tiffany's catalog. He sure didn't look like the work of a man who lived in this shithole. I told you that girls number seven and seventeen were no longer with us. Dead, actually, the wolf finally said. Our boy genius is forgetful, no? Details, details, said Yegi. Speaking of which, you owe me 15,000 cash on delivery. This would be considered delivery. The wolf reached into his suit jacket and pulled out a Sig Sauer 210. He shot Yegi twice between the eyes. Then, for laughs, he shot Albert Einstein between the eyes, too. Looks like you are no longer with us, Mr. Titov. Details. Details. The wolf sat at a laptop computer and fixed the sales catalog himself. Then he burned his CD and took it with him. Also, several copies of Novaya Ruskaya Slovo that he had missed. He would send a crew to dispose of the body and burn this shithole later. Details. Details. Chapter 26 I skipped a class on arrest techniques that morning. I figured I probably knew more on the subject than the teacher. I called Monty Donnelly instead and told her I needed whatever she had on the white slave trade, particularly recent activity in the U.S. that might relate to the white girl case. Most of the Bureau's crime analysts were housed ten miles away at CERG, but Monty had an office at Quantico. Less than an hour later, she was at the doorway of my no-frills cubicle. She held out two discs, looking proud of herself. This should keep you busy for a while. I concentrated on white women only. Attractive, recent abductions. I also have a lot on the crime scene in Atlanta. I expanded the circle to get a read on the mall, owner, employees, the neighborhood in Buckhead. I have copies for you of the police and the Bureau's investigative reports. All the things you asked for. You do your homework, don't you? I'm a student of the game. I prepare as best I can. Is that so unusual? Here at Quantico? Actually, it is for agents who come to us from police departments or the armed forces. They seem to like to work out in the field. I like field work, too, I admitted to Monty. But not until I've narrowed it some. Thank you for this. All of this. Do you know what they say about you, Dr. Cross? No. What do they say? That you're close to psychic, very imaginative, maybe even gifted. You can think like a killer. That's why they put you on white girl right away. She remained in the doorway. Listen, someone asked for advice, if I may. You shouldn't piss off Gordo Nooney. He takes his little orientation game seriously. He's also basically a bad guy. And he's connected. I'll remember that, I nodded. So there are good guys, too? Absolutely. You'll see that most of the agents are real solid. Good people, the best. All right, well, happy hunting, Monty said. Then she left me to my reading. Lots and lots of reading. Too much. I started off with a couple of abductions, both in Texas, that I thought could be related to the one in Atlanta. Just reading the accounts got my blood boiling again, though. Marianne Norman, 20, had disappeared in Houston on August 6, 2001. She'd been staying with her college sweetheart in a condo owned by his grandparents. Marianne and Dennis Turcos were going to be seniors at Texas Christian that fall and had planned to be married in the spring of 2002. Everybody said they were the nicest kids in the world. Marianne was never seen or heard from after that night in August. On December 30th of that year... Dennis Turcos had put a revolver to his head and killed himself. He said he couldn't live without Marianne, that his life had ended when she disappeared. The second case involved a 15-year-old runaway from Childress, Texas. Adrienne Tuletti had been snatched from an apartment in San Antonio where three girls said to be involved in prostitution lived. Neighbors in the complex reported having seen two suspicious-looking people, a male and a female, entering the building on the day that Adrienne disappeared. One neighbor thought they might have been the girl's parents coming to bring their daughter home, but the girl was never seen or heard from again. I looked at her picture for a long moment. 
She was a pretty blonde and looked as if she 